I feel like there was a time where it was like everyone was screaming like, love your body, love yeah. yourself. And it was intense. And now I almost think when you get to a really good place and you're so peaceful, it's not even a thought process. Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of Vulnerable. I am your host, Chelsea Vaughn, and today we have a very special guest. Her name is Iskra Lawrence. If you guys don't know her, she's a model and content creator, but she was literally the face of Airy and their Airy Real campaign for seven years. So like back in, I don't know, 2015, when Airy Real was kind of like the first, they were really the first to do like the body positive movement and like not having their models retouched online. Like when you think about Airy Real and the model, it's Iskra. Um, so she's here today to talk all about modeling, to talk about body positivity versus body neutrality. We're talking about social media. Um, and now she launched a company. So she's kind of transferred from modeling into more other ventures. She has a company called Saltaire. You guys have probably seen it or heard of it in Target. It's body care and body wash, and she's also a co-host with her husband on a podcast called Couplish. So she does a lot of things. She has her hands in a lot of different pots, and she also is not necessarily a new mom, but she's a mom, and she has a three-year-old. So I kind of was just asking her tips, advice, how she got here, how she does it all and juggles everything. Um... So I love the episode. She's just incredible and super authentic and genuine. And I just find her so refreshing. Um, so I think it'll be a lovely episode for you guys to get to know her and to learn a lot too. She really gave a lot of good opinions and tidbits just on how to be confident and how to be a badass boss bitch in this world that we live in. So without further ado, here is Iskra. Today on the podcast, we have Iskra Lawrence. Yay! Iskra, welcome to Vulnerable. I'm here. <laughs> She's here. She's in New York. Thank you so much for coming into the studio. I'm really excited to have you. Um, Iskra and I met very, very recently. I yeah, like. the beginning of this year is yes. a 2023 yes. friendship. <laughs> she invited me to her beautiful one-year anniversary of her Saltaire Brands yeah. dinner. And I ever, like that dinner, I feel like was so just so inspiring and like Aww. genuine. And I was just so glad I went. Like I literally went home and told my friend all about it. Like I was like, oh my God, I met so many like amazing women. Yay. And like, I love that you made everyone go around the table and like talk about how we can help each other and what mm -hmm. we do. And I just thought that was so like lovely because I go to a lot of like brand dinners and nobody does that. You know, things move so fast. I think we forget to be intentional sometimes. And it's like, we all bothered coming together, amazing people in a room. It's like, let's just pause and just try and take a second to really connect yeah. so that's that's all it, you know I always try and do with my events or when I get together or even like our dinner last yeah. night just getting together with friends and getting to know each other and it's important yeah I just loved that because I feel like a lot of people especially like LA New York and like in our career fields are always like oh yeah, let's get together like we should do this we should do this and then nobody shows up Nobody shows up. Like, I told you yes. at the dinner that like I, I was always inviting people to things, even when I lived in New York. And I would have like a group chat of, it's got to be nearly 20 kind of model girls because that's really all the people I knew when I moved to New York. And I would invite everyone to dinner. And like four people would show up. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, you're my people. Oh. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's hard. And I get, I'm always really understanding. And actually since becoming a mom and like having a business, I've had to say no more, but I try and not commit or say no, like early, not wait last minute and then yeah. just like not show up. Right. Yeah. And like, even when I asked you to be on the podcast, like we've only met once, twice now. And I'm like, and, Here she, we are. and she came. <laughs> so I love that. I love you for that. Thank Yay. you for coming. Um, so we always start with what's going Vaughn, which is my mm -hmm. uh, pop culture segment. So I feel like we have to talk about Hailey Bieber and Selena Gomez. We again. do, because I can't open up TikTok without seeing one of them being talked about. And then Kylie Jenner is involved too. Yes. Okay, <laughs> if you guys don't know what's going on, you must be living under a rock. But <laughs> right now they're feuding, the girlies are feuding again. They are. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what I saw was that 
Selena Gomez posted, this is how it all started. Selena yeah. posted a video or like did a live mm -hmm. where she was like, I accidentally laminated my eyebrows too much. Yeah. And then Kylie Jenner posted on her story a picture of her, a close up picture of her eyebrow mm -hmm. with the, this was an accident written over it. And yeah. then a screenshot of her FaceTiming Hailey Bieber with just, just their the eyebrows. eyebrows. <laughs> Do you think that was a coincidence? No. I don't think there's any It shot. was manufactured for sure. I just don't know if like they're all in it. Yeah. Do they have the same PR team? You think Selena's <laughs> in, it, in on it too? Maybe. It's just like, how is it just constantly happening? But I don't, it is mean girl energy in one sense, but I don't know if it's more just they know how to create controversy and they're doing it for that reason. Like it really wasn't meant to make her feel bad about it, but they knew that it was going to get people talking just like we are right now. Maybe. I mean, Kris Jenner could be behind all of this. She really could. <laughs> she could have planned all this. They I had a meeting <laughs> at the top of 2021 <laughs> and they were like, okay, if you and Kylie are like match for match of who gets followed, let's make a thing of it. I mean, yeah. So now Selena Gomez is officially the most followed, most followed. person on mm -hmm. Instagram, which is crazy. It's like, I don't even know what the number is. 318 million or something. It's so many I, people. I, it's, it's so many people. It's wild. Um, there's just been a lot of people making TikToks about mm -hmm. it, like people arguing that it could have been a coincidence. And I saw this one, like one of the bigger TikToks. Mm. Uh, Kylie commented. Oh, and said, um, you guys are making something out of nothing. No hate towards Selena ever. Like, this is all taken out of context or whatever. And then Selena commented. Oh, my god! Under, hey, under okay. Kylie's comment and said, totally agree. I'm a fan of Kylie. Always have been. But not a fan of Hailey. She left well, Hailey out of the comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm misquote. I, I don't know for sure if she left Hailey in or out. But she said, like, I'm a fan of Kylie's. I don't know if she mentioned Haley. I can't remember. And then all the comments underneath Selena's were like, girl, like, they're mean girling you. Like, you're just not seeing it. Like, stop saying you're a fan of them. They hate you, girl. And I was oh like, oh. Oh, my gosh. But I just feel like I've never seen a fandom like these Selena fans. Yeah, because I think Selena's so relatable mm -hmm. in the sense of she has been through so much. Yeah. And she does really keep it real. It's like a different level. She talks about it. You know, she's really and shared it it's not easy to share when you're feeling broken when you're feeling like you don't know where your mental health's at and a lot of people only talk about it when it's you know they figured it out yeah and they've maybe like she was like in the thick of it and sharing it yeah um and obviously she took time off but she always kind of came back and continued on to like let people in and I think that's why people feel so connected to her yeah I agree um I think Hailey Bieber's a little bit more like not mysterious, but like we don't really know much about yes. her in that way. There's like a protection there, a layer of protection, which maybe that works out the best for her. Maybe that's why she, maybe she, I don't know. We don't know her mental health. We, we don't, don't know, know much about her. She's, yeah. You know, and maybe that's her protection method is like hiding behind that more perfected, curated wall than Selena has because – I feel like when I was in my postpartum and just had a child, I felt almost because I was like very real and shared authentically mm. online that I had to be super real and authentic and post those mm. like challenging times. And then I was like, why do I feel the need to have to post that? Yeah. And so then I had this like weird moment of like, oh, imagine if, you know, I just didn't does that make me less relatable or right. should I feel that like I should just be looking after myself right now yeah it's not, almost not thinking to be authentic I should be posting about it that's like it, almost inauthentic yeah it's weird I I get that though because I feel like it's almost like you 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 want to give the people I guess what they want and like you want them to feel like they can relate yeah. to you but then it's like am I who am I doing this for now <laughs> right and where does that boundary stop yeah and for Selena it's like has she given so much and been so vulnerable and had to keep it so real that, you know, it's actually challenging for her. Yeah. But the thing that annoys me about this whole like little triangle, I guess you can call it, <laughs> is that like, so the, the fans always make it about Justin Bieber. And I'm oh. like, they dated a million years yeah. ago. Like, I don't know why they bring that back up. I don't think it's about Justin at this point. I don't, I don't think... I don't know. I feel like celebrities, I, I do think there could be a PR team behind all there of this. Be, I, I, I hope, uh, it should already have happened, but I hope like when Selena, if she wants to, mm -hmm. gets married and like has that kind of like relationship security, then maybe people will drop it because I feel like until then people still think that, oh, we feel bad for her. Like she's single, like Hayley got her guy and they're yeah. married and they'll probably have kids soon. And 
And it's like sing being single is awesome. Yeah. Selena's career is just popping. Like she's doing everything. She's having impact. She's inspiring people. Like just because you got the man doesn't necessarily mean that you won. Right. And we also will never know what actually happened behind the scenes never in that know. relationship. Like never it might know. not have gone down like that at all. Mm-mm. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so for everyone who like might not know you, yeah. I want to – well, first I love to do people's like age, where they're from, and their star sign. Okay. So age, I'm 32. Star sign, I'm a Virgo. Virgo. And I'm from a tiny town called Kidderminster, which – um, like the area I try and equate to like the Ohio of England. Okay. It's not really a tourist destination <laughs> or some, somewhere that you really want to, you know, stay for long periods of time. So I knew I had to have like an exit plan. Okay. Not because I don't love that my dad is one of 10 and they all live there, but more just because I needed opportunity. I wanted to spread my wings. There was things I wanted to achieve and I would not have been able to do that if I'd stayed in my tiny town. Yeah. So I moved to London. I moved out of home about 18 and then started living with my ex-boyfriend at the time. Um, And we lived in multiple different places. And then I moved to London and had like two years of wild, crazy time. Remember, I don't drink now and there's a reason for that. (laughs) Um, I haven't drunk for like a decade, actually. I haven't really like ever celebrated that or talked about it much. Um, And then I moved to New York when I was 23. Wow. Been in America for ever since, nine years. Yeah, almost 10 years. Ten, near to 10 years. Yeah. yeah. So you told me you started modeling when you were how old? So I entered Earl Glow Search for a Supermodel when I was 12 and a half. 12 and a half. Yeah. That is crazy. Isn't that wild? And then you've kind of just been modeling ever since? Yeah, I got, so I didn't win the competition. Okay. I went down to London, did the whole kind of photo shoot thing. And then Sarah Dukaus, who actually... Um, her claim to fame was that she scouted Kate Moss amongst oh. many other supermodels. She scouted me and I was on the models to watch board um, at the agency because you can't actually really model until you're like 14, 15. Right. Um, so that's when I started doing like fashion TV catwalks and like just lots of test shoots and little photo shoots. And then I got my bigger break I guess I was the face of Claire's accessories when I was like 15 and that was huge because there's a Claire's accessories in every like small town in every mall yeah so my friends from school would like run down at lunchtime and be like oh my gosh you're on the Claire's accessories and it was global and you know I think I got I want to say I got paid like five thousand pounds which was a lot of money when you're 15 15 from the middle of nowhere so that was kind of like it gave me this confidence that I know what I want I know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna be a huge success and then I got dropped <laughs> <laughs> because literally I was doing these fashion shows for fashion tv and gosh it was so long ago it's hard to remember specifically like which one this was but there was one in particular and I went you know backstage to get changed with everyone else we're all in the room we're just stripping down to like our thongs and I couldn't fit into any of the clothes Like one after one, I tried it on. They were just getting stuck at like my thighs and my hips. And the stylist literally was like, what's wrong? Why can't you fit into the clothes? Like, ugh. And like, it was public Mm. in front of everyone. And I was so young. I was like 15. And I I just really at that point felt there was something wrong with my size. Yeah. Bearing in mind, I'm probably a US four, you know, or six. at the time. And so then my agent like found out that I wasn't fitting into sample size. You get measured anyway a lot, and yeah. I'm sure they've stopped it a little bit, but generally you do have to keep up with your measurements so you can let clients know. So every six months at least, maybe more, I was getting measured, and my hips were 37 inches, and I remember it, and they were like, ah, oh, they really need to be 35 inches. And then sure enough, they were like, we're going to give you a list of other agencies that we think that maybe would want to represent you, and there was like 10 or 11, and I went to every single one. And they all like gave me some kind of excuse or like one in, one was being really sweet and saying, oh, we could see you being like a VS girl one day or this, that and the other. And I did like a whole shoot there in the agency and the pictures, they were like looking at them and they just said, oh, there was just one agent that just didn't think you're the right fit. So sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's real, I think. Yeah. Even that was a while ago, obviously. Yeah. But even when I came to New York and started mm. modeling for the first time, like my hips were, and I was older, but my hips were like 36. And that was not okay. Like they were like, <gasps> no, you got to be at 35. They when they, was this? What year? 2018. 
Mm-hmm. See that? It's, see, this is this. Ugh, everyone <laughs> thinks we're making progress, and there's just still so much ugh, that's going on that yeah. is not okay. I mean, I don't know now. I haven't been measured in a while, and the agency yeah. that I'm with now is pretty like they're right. they're pretty chill. Like they're more if you book things and people want you, like you know, we're not that concerned about the measuring tape. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are still a lot of agencies here that will whip it out as soon as you come in and be like, oh, if it's not a thirty five or thirty four. Yeah, and and. I will never I will never say there's a good reason for it, but there is a reason for it it's because designers create their samples in a certain size and right. the agents want to provide models that all fit in those samples because right. you're more likely to get booked and keep the designers happy because they want you to fit in their clothes and they don't want to have to make alterations and change these beautiful, especially if you're thinking couture or thinking um, couture. <laughs> Sure. 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 Um, uh, but I, I get why it's easier to make that one small size. and. But they could make a new sample size. They should make multiple sample sizes, yeah. you know, but that's multiple fabrics, multiple seamstresses, you know, all the... Ugh. Yeah. But we're talking about how do we save society from the epidemic of low self-esteem, low self-worth, and, you know, mental health issues. And often they are coming from and related to body image. Yeah. And what we're consuming and what we're being told and what this unrealistic beauty standard is. And a lot of it stems from the fact that we're just shown one standard of beauty, one size of beauty. Yeah. I wanted to ask you your thoughts on, like, body positivity versus body neutrality. Mm, yeah, that's that's a really good one because – when I first started, I didn't even know what I was doing. I right. was speaking about my own eating disorder, my own body dysmorphia, um, and and that because of being in the fashion industry so young. And so when I started kind of like being open and sharing these unphotoshopped images and talking about this, everyone c- called me like the queen of body positivity. Mm-hmm. This is back in like 2015, about that time. Little did I know that there was a body positive movement that was created for more marginalized bodies than mine. I'm still white, I'm still able-bodied, I'm still hourglass. And so I got called out by the body positive community because I was taking up space Mm -hmm. and I was essentially like dismantling what they had created because they needed it more than me. And yet I was like the poster child for it and all of these magazine articles and brands were like, using me and paying me because they wanted to be part of this body positive movement. And so I had to really, you know, not even unlearn because I didn't, I didn't even know what was happening. I didn't even know what viral was. And I was kind of going viral and people were putting labels on it because unfortunately women always have to have a label. (laughs) And so I had to encourage people to call it body acceptance instead of body positivity. Okay. Because that wasn't made for people like me. Okay. Um, so I love body neutrality because when we talk about and when we think about, you know, body acceptance or body positivity, if that pertains to you, we think about like that end result of being in love and like super comfortable with yourself and just so confident. And that is almost so unrealistic that it makes people not even want to start or know where to start. And body neutrality is kind of like stepping stone one. Yeah. And I love it because it enables you to literally just think of your body in the most basic way, its functions, its abilities, what it enables you to do just day to day. Um, And I, when I'm talking to people who do have low self-esteem or body image issues, I always start with body neutrality work and I encourage people to look in the mirror and literally just reel off the things your body does for you. Like go throughout your day and just be like, oh, I didn't have these hands and arms. I wouldn't be able to make breakfast this morning. I like eating breakfast. <laughs> you know, like very just kind of like, and that is really wonderful way for people to just start getting to a point where they don't really dislike or feel negative towards their body. It's like, I don't love my body. I might not even like it, but you know what? I can accept it and have a neutral feeling about it. Yeah. I know? love I love the idea of being just neutral about it because yeah. it's not like, our bodies aren't here just for the looks. <laughs> yes. Like they're literally here for everything but the looks. Like they're here to take care of us and make us feel good. Like we, we woke up this morning, you know? Yeah. Like if you think about your body in that way, then you're like, I have a great body if you think about it like that. Um, so I, I love the like space that's been kind of created for mm-hmm. being able to just be neutral. 
And I feel like in a way I've pulled back a little bit from doing so much of the like celebratory body talk just because I want people to, it can be, feel a bit forced. I feel like there was a time where it was like everyone was screaming like, love your body, love yeah. yourself. And it was intense. And now I almost think when you get to a really good place and you're so peaceful, it's not even a thought process. Yeah. I don't wake up and I'm like, I must talk about loving my thighs today. <laughs> it's just like, no. These thighs are awesome. They get me through the day. Like, that's it. So I think that that's like the movement where we're at. However, I'm worried that because I know that I've pulled away from speaking about it and multiple other people maybe felt similarly that there was so much talk about love your body, embrace yourself, da, da, da. And that's kind of not such a big topic. Has that caused things to go backwards? Mm. Because not everyone's being so vocal about it. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's more the recession. I think it's more the pandemic. And I think it's more like the way consumers have spent or spending or not spending is dictating what fashion brands and companies, how they're marketing and how they're pulling back uh, extended sizing and how they're using their like safe go-to model, which is the slim, straight size, white, blonde, black, like, me, but slimmer type model, <laughs> um, because that's like where their safety is. Yeah. And they don't want to risk alienating their loyal customer to bring in a new customer. But that, like, it's should that all... necessarily be your, you and everybody else's responsibility to uphold? Because I have other friends that are creators that are mm. body, con- I mean, they've been put in the box of right. being a body positive creator. Mm-hmm. And I've heard them say things like, I feel like I'm not even allowed to if I authentically like am having a bad day where I just feel shitty about something or like right. I feel like I can't even be myself or have those moments because so many people follow me and are counting on me yeah. to be this body positive queen. And if you don't have body positive attached to your definition, then also why do brands want to work with you? Mm. You know, and I think that there has been a period where it was oversaturated and then brands were getting, you know, praised for it and celebrated. But then when it became more normalized and they weren't, then they stopped doing it. Yeah. Because they were like, we're not getting the the praise and the, the celebration that we wanted. And again, that's just performative. Right. And I, I think that's what's feeling really a little bit sad and disheartening for a lot of people in that like body acceptance community is that it feels like the whole thing was performative. I feel like it's really similar to race in that way, too, Mm -hmm. because in 2020, 2021, like Black Lives Matter was at its peak and all these brands were trying to hop on board and and do everything they could and and hire more black models. And like Mm -hmm. even like reality TV, like the only reason we had Mm. finally got a black bachelor on the 25th season (laughs) was because of the timing. And it was like the most diverse season they ever had. And then we're just slowly trickling back to the same old Mm -hmm. white guy as Bachelor and all the white girls. And it's just like, you just did it for show. Yeah, because because you had to. Because cancel culture was his all-time high. Yeah. Because people were like, you need to be accountable. And I don't, yeah, I don't know what happened. It it was, felt like change was happening. Yeah. And then, yeah, people were just like, oh, I don't think I'm going to get canceled if I just... (laughs) Go retreat back, retreat yeah. back. I don't, it's, it is bizarre. It does feel like two steps forward, one step back almost, but mm-hmm. hopefully we're progressing somewhat. <laughs> Do you ever feel pressured to like, because you got popular and famous for, not for your body, but like for that kind of modeling, do you feel pressured to post your body a lot? Like Every so, day. Yeah. Every day. And I'm in this like battle because my audience is like 50% male and female. Mm. And so the way the algorithm works and like engagement works, and that's all people care about right now is like engagement rate. Oh, it's like, it's weird because the more I post like my body and being confident and all that type of stuff, it's like, if A, that's what my audience has been used to seeing. So they kind of like, oh, it's Iskra speaking about what she's always spoken about. It connects with them. And then I get obviously the male engagement too. And then so it shows it to more of my audience, which shows it to more people. So it's like this spiral effect. But yeah, it feels like, oh, I wish I could detach myself from it sometimes to just post me baking a cake. Yeah. But the problem <laughs> is if I post, post a cake, um, you know, without a bikini on, <laughs> 
then it's like no one's going to engage with yeah. it. It drops my engagement. It Fs my algorithm. And then the next time a brand wants to work with me, my algorithm sucks. And they either yeah. don't want to work with me or they won't pay me as much. So it's like it is this weird time and I'm trying to find ways that basically my family isn't supported just by Instagram yeah. brand deals because it's shifted so quickly so much. Um, and obviously I'm building Saltaire, but I don't take a salary from Saltaire. And there's like, so many reasons why, but the main reason is we reinvest everything into the brand because when you're in a startup, to take a salary straight away just means that you're going to be taking away from possible marketing budget, possible innovation to create new products. And because this is something I need to work, not want to work, like I have to reinvest everything mm. to make it a, a success and a huge success to make it just worth everything that I'm putting into it, you know? Yeah. Well, let me know if you figure out how to, how to get out of that box on Instagram because I'm in the same boat, like, because people were introduced to me via dating show okay. and dating. Unless I'm talking about dating, nobody cares. <laughs> like, no, like yeah. my content doesn't get engagement, but like... People love that niche. It's like yeah. they, they stick a label and you put you in a box and want that niche. And if I popped up on Instagram oh. tomorrow baking a cake... Nobody Same cares. thing. We got to start baking cakes yeah. together. <laughs> We're all going to start baking cakes. You guys better like it. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about people commenting specifically mm. on your body? Because even when I went to your page, like <laughs> to post the Instagram's coming on my podcast, like yeah. I looked at your comment section <laughs> and there's people in there just like, oh, you lost weight. Oh, you did this. Oh, and I'm just like, Sometimes I think people think it's a compliment to comment on your body, yeah. but it's like, they don't know what's going on with you. It is wild. I'm, I'm honestly kind of numb to it now, which I don't know if that's a sad thing or like a win for me, but I will literally get like a comment that says cow and like, oh, you've let yourself go. You're disgusting. And then the one below will be like, oh my goodness, I love you, curvy goddess queen. And <laughs> I'm just like, whatever, you figure it out. I'm very happy where I'm at. Like, right. I'm very grateful. My body enabled me to have my child. That's the biggest blessing in the world. And really nothing can like knock me now. Yeah. The fact that, you know, I'm in such a loving relationship where, you know, he worships me and I'm so attracted to him. We fancy each other and we have this like spark still. I know it's only been, what was it, four and a half years? Who knows? Okay. It's been a while, but you know, I, I'm, we might not say that for 40 years, but it just, <laughs> it, it, other people's opinions really do just like water off a duck's back. My yeah. only concern is I know other people read it and that gives them like, what? Oh. People think Iskra's fat. Oh, people think she's she's lost weight and she's thin. Oh, da, da, da. and then they start comparing themselves. And that's why like my number one like advice for anyone is just stop comparing yourself to others. And I mm. mean, real life and online because it's only going to confuse you and then you start picking yourself apart. And you can compare yourself like in totality, right? Like my success in life. Wow, she's got a successful brand. Little do they know I'm broke right now because I've put everything into the brand, you right. know, and I'm panicking because Instagram's changed and I, I'm like late to the game on TikTok looking like some 32 year old. <laughs> <laughs> washed mom <laughs> so it's just like the reality of people like comparing themselves to anything it just doesn't make sense because you have no idea what's going on and yeah. look at poor selena okay. like, is, she, is she really getting mean girl and yeah. yet she's the most followed person in the world yeah. got one of the most successful makeup brands in the world it's just like don't compare yourself to anyone yeah, I think I think definitely it is a win for that you that I it just rolls off win. your back now because <laughs> I, I think you've just been definitely clearly in the industry for so long at this point and you've had so much feedback from other people that at some point I'm sure you were just like fuck this like I, I can't care yeah. about what other people say anymore um definitely that I'm still working on that <laughs> oh you've got it I mean it can take time and it can yeah. depend what environment you're in I yeah. for sure me moving to Austin where no one cares like mm -hmm. there's been very very few times where even I get recognized yeah. like it's really nice no one really cares no one's talking about you know industry gossip or especially modeling right like when I lived in New York most of my friends were models what did they talk about other models <laughs> did you see so-and-so book that like why does she get that like da -da -da -da. and I just oh so I hate that kind of talk negative environment <laughs> yes. yeah for sure so how did you transition and I know kind of a little bit of the story but I want everyone else to hear <laughs> how did you transition from and you still model but mm -hmm. from modeling to owning and launching a brand so I'm really proud of myself because I did seven years with Aerie 
And when I was with Airy, um, I had a really strong contract. I had 50 days a year, which is kind of unheard of. And so I had a really solid amount of money and I saved it all. I actually, men always get to talk about money. So let's talk about money. Talk about um, it. <laughs> I saved a million dollars. Oh my God. I had a million dollars cash in my bank account. Shit. And I was like, what <laughs> am I going to do? And th- I don't drink. I barely go out. I do not buy designer jewelry. I buy secondhand bags. Like I was just, even though I was earning a lot of money, I saved, saved, saved because like I said, I come from Kidderminster. I'm not trying to go back there. I'm not trying to ever worry about eating or having a roof over my head. And I was like, if I never earn money again tomorrow, if this modeling career disappears, if Aerie disappeared, they did actually cancel my contract in the <laughs> pandemic. I was like, what am I going to build that's going to sustain this lifestyle? I don't need to be a billionaire. I don't need to, you know, have all the chains yeah. or whatever. I just want to feel secure and safe. And as a woman, I think having financial security is so important because then you don't end up in relationships or in environments that aren't safe because you're stuck there because financially you can't be free Mm -hmm. or just move countries or go somewhere else or live on your own. So I was like, this is my security and saving for the rest of my life. So I started doing a lot of research on investments and I knew that if I was going to start my own brand, it made sense to invest in other brands in other different parts of the industry. So I have invested in like a workout fitness brand called Oxfit that have like home, the most, the world's most expensive, it's a wonderful home gym that's like super smart. And then investing money into like a swimwear brand, investing money into a app that's about investing. I know that's like confusing, but just making multiple different investments. So if the industry I decided to go in, which obviously is beauty, body care, um, that no matter what happened, if a recession happened, something's going to still be bringing in income Mm. or something's going to give me future wealth. Um, So I invested in property as well. I'm on my fourth um, property renovating. I don't know if I'm going to flip it or live in it yet. It depends. (laughs) depends. It's a bit stressful right now. I kind of got screwed by my contractor, but... Is it in Texas? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So having those multiple different investments, I was like, okay, now what's my brand going to be? You know, what is the industry? And for me, when I think about inclusivity, I don't want to leave anybody out. Mm -hmm. I want everybody to feel welcome. Hence our tagline, everybody's welcome here. And I was like, body wash. It's like a necessary product. It doesn't have a size attached to it. Like everyone, I think, uses body wash. (laughs) Most people use body wash. We hope. And so it it was just a way for me to touch people and bring them a product that had a purpose. And the mission was to literally take people to an exotic, peaceful location, salt air, breathing in the salt air, stand in the toes, waves crashing, like that moment of peace that I like crave so much during the chaos of the pandemic and new baby life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it was that escape that I wanted to give to everybody, regardless of their body, their size, where they're from. And even price. Like that's why we made it affordable and we've partnered with Target because that's like where everybody shops. Yeah. You know, everybody. it's just so accessible. Love that. Yeah. I uh I showered before I came here, guys, and I used her body wash. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> and I've been using the oil too. Whatever oh. you gave me, I've been using it all. Yay. Um I just I feel like I love that story because I I feel like I'm kind of in that place that where you were before. I don't have a million dollars. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> it's all um, gone. <laughs> it's all gone. But hopefully uh, when I'm like 50, I'll be like, I made some good decisions when yeah. I was 20, you know, 28, 29. But Let's I see. just like, I started modeling, not that young, but like I started mm-hmm. modeling and like I got my degree and, mm-hmm. and I, I'm now at this kind of turning point where I'm like, yeah, I can still model, but it's not like my main focus or goal. Mm. And I am doing influencing and yeah. partnerships and all that in social media. But if social media vanished, like I want to have another part of my Absolutely. brand and another form of income. And I highly recommend a couple of things. This is my biggest regret and I'm still having to figure out how I move forward. Email list email list like why didn't someone tell me 10 years ago to make an email list yeah so that's like my biggest regret and I I just hope everyone else gets an email list yes. before I do um and what was the other piece of advice yeah obviously passive income and when you are when you are 
speaking to brands, mm-hmm. obviously, like, I personally always go for, like, a more long-term partnership mm-hmm. because I feel like then people know Iskra always is drinking something with vital proteins in. Right. You know, like, I've worked with them for a long time now because I've used their products for nearly six years. So it's like when – and when you go into those longer-term partnerships or smaller up-and-coming brands, you could always do Swequity as well. So Swequity would be like, hey, in exchange for X amount of posts, could I have a small percentage mm. of your company? So there's a few brands I've done that with. Wow. Yeah. I haven't even thought about that. Mm-hmm. So that's like a really good way because who knows what these brands could become. Yeah. And if you really believe in it too, then you could also offer like, hey, I would want to be on the board of this brand because I care about it so much. I feel like, you know, what I have to bring to the table, my voice or my platform could be really beneficial. I could give you advice on you know, speaking to your customer or right. social media. So finding creative ways to work with brands other than the quick cash grab, which listen, right. we all need a quick cash grab sometimes, <laughs> but like I've tried to do a mix of that too. Yeah. It's like, so at least once a year, there will be more of like a sweatquity deal where I will work with a brand purely, either it doesn't, isn't paid at all. And it's like, mm. I'm going to get, I know, 0.1% of the company. I'm writing this and down. And you, <laughs> you hope that the company is going to IPO and say, you know, you bought your shares at, thirty thousand dollars worth of shares when it ipo they could be worth 10 times that yeah it's it's just like uh it's just trying lots of different things because we're all it feels like social media is just one thing right it's posting on social media and getting paid to do it we know it's not that now that we know that there is affiliate links we know that there are so many other ways to earn when you post it's just kind of like thinking about it as a whole as a yeah. whole thing I know I one of my goals last year was to start investing like mm-hmm. invest in something yeah research investing and I did a couple of things but I still want to do more and like learn more I definitely have I've never invested in a like a company or well, like a little brand app, I like <laughs> the public app which I'm invested in oh <laughs> um, it, it's an app that makes investing really accessible and okay. easy and it's like social media for investing so I really like it because it will show you what people have invested in. And I'll be like, oh, I invested in Beyond Meat because I think it's really great to have alternatives, even though we love our meat, yeah. like last <laughs> night. It's also like, my dad's vegetarian. So if that's a brand that you use and consume, why would I not buy some shares in that? Yeah. So that I think is a great place. If you've never invested and you don't know where to start, because you can literally invest as little as a dollar, mm. which that won't do much. But right. <laughs> if you invested a dollar, Every single day yeah. for five years. And then that company, look at Crocs. Crocs grew so much. I've, I've never kicked myself more from just like, I should have invested in Crocs as soon as I saw Post Malone wear them, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But you live and you learn. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is something that I, like, I feel like a lot of people will talk about and like the position I feel like I'm in right now is mm. I could maybe launch a brand. Like I could mm-hmm. maybe do that in the future. That's something I could see myself going towards. But what is something that nobody ever really talks about when it comes to starting your own brand? It's 24-7. Yeah. You know, that's the major difference for me. It's with modeling, especially, I feel like, of course, you pitch yourself, you go to the casting, but then you turn up to the shoot, someone does your hair and makeup, you do the photos and you finish and you go home and you wash the makeup off and you can sit down and you can watch maybe a TV show. Right. Like I said, it. I've just finished Love Island from the summer because that's how little amount of time I get to just sit down and watch something and not work. It is just 24-7. I mean, I have alarms set on my phone so many times in the day to check our sales, to check if there's been a spike. Like, where did that spike come from? Did it come from this random girl on TikTok? Who's that? Do we need to go and, like, work with her? Like... And that, it's just, it just never stops. Yeah. So it's a wonderful thing because it's something you love and you care about. And that's why you really have to love the shit out of your brand Mm -hmm. because it's like having a child. It really is. And it demands you to always be there to provide like answers. (laughs) And sometimes I don't have the answer. Yeah. And you know, someone on my team will be like, Iskra, we need to know, da, da, da. Or what do you think about? And sometimes I just want to be like, I don't know, figure it out. (laughs) But you have to figure, you have to then come up with something to at least give them just something they can go on with and and work on. And so, yeah, that is the only thing. And I'm going to Mexico for spring break. And I'm like, I wonder if I can switch my phone off 
for a couple of days yeah. and what would that look like and like what would that mean so I think again startup is very different from hopefully we get to the point in like four years five years where we'll have a team come in and we might transact and we might I don't know maybe get bought by either an investment company or a Unilever or L'Oreal who knows and right. then at that point it would be very different because we can have so much more of like a team structure and whatnot but I would just say yeah if you're like oh I could just start a brand and there are ways you can do that right you can white label or you can just license your name and so for example like um Jessica why am I thinking of a second name? blonde singer Simpson <laughs> Jessica Simpson she licensed her name. She's got Jessica Simpson home, Jessica shoes. Simpson shoes, yeah. da, 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 da. So, and she's probably got, I don't know how much she will have of that, but sometimes it's like 20% a licensing deal might be. Um, and then you have to, you know, renegotiate it. A bit like Rihanna with Fenty, with mm. Fenty Beauty. She had, and I think it was only for the first year or two, she had a deal and then they went back and negotiated it after it was hugely successful. Mm. And then I don't know where she's at now, but she's probably in a position to maybe like, buy back a majority chunk of the company. I don't know. I mean, she's a billionaire, so. <laughs> exactly. So there is there are many, many ways to do it, but I think don't be scared to try because even if you fail, you tried something. Yeah. And I've had many, many, many failed, you know, things I've tried to do. And I'm just glad I just kept learning from them to get to a point now where I feel more confident. And I'm also not scared to fail because it's like, what's the worst that can happen? You lose some money, you lose some time. That's it. Mm. You can go again. Yeah. Speaking of time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm saying, how do you have the time to do all this? Like, you are a mom now, a new mom. Yeah. You're a wifey. You're a podcast host. Mm -hmm. You're a CEO of a brand, yeah. a model. Like, how, how do you do – like, I think a lot of times it's like, oh, like, as a woman – I don't know if we can have it all. Like, can we have oh, the, the kid and the family yeah. and the wife and also the career? So like, how, how are you doing all of this at the same time? <laughs> I mean, I think it depends on your personality. It depends on your bandwidth. I think some people can do more than others because I don't, I mean, I've got people who feel super, super overwhelmed and anxious um, or wouldn't want to travel as much as I do. And so I think just listening to what you're comfortable with and knowing. But the modeling was always hectic because Aerie would have me shooting and going all over the place. So I feel like I was always trained for this very much like you're on the road, you're figuring things out as you go. Um, and then I've got a great support network around me when I do need to just like have some affirmations, have people support me, have a cry and say like, oh my gosh, I said yes to too many things <laughs> and now I can't do enough. Like I, I'm struggling to keep up. Um, and But I really try and focus on the like, I've got an abundance of time. I've got an abundance of energy. Like I'm going to do this. There are many other successful people who have had to work far harder than me because they started in far harder situations than me. So yeah, I just think one day I'll retire and then I'll be bored and I'll have nothing to do. So it's just like, I'm just enjoying being able to do all these things that I never imagined coming from the small town that I did that I actually be able to do. Yeah. That's a really good way of looking at it. Okay. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and do Chell It Like It Is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Our first question is how to be more confident in your own body and how to heal your mental health. Mm, big questions. Yeah. People always ask me a lot how to be confident. So I would love to hear your answer on this. Yeah. Confidence is kind of faked at the beginning, if I'm honest. Um, I think that when you choose to try it and you realize, you know what, I made the choice to feel confident today and you've got to take it day by day, right? And situation by situation. There are still some situations where I'm like, oh, wow, I realize I'm feeling nervous or maybe not so confident in myself. And that's usually because it's around a group of people maybe I don't know or they're from a different environment than me that I don't feel maybe I'm welcome or like they're ready for me. And that's a weird thing to say, but like maybe super, super rich people mm. <laughs> or like people from a, a place or a time or, or even a level of success like a few weeks ago, I went for like dinner and my friend was like, yeah, everyone are billionaires. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> yeah. I'm a bit nervous. Yeah. Like, I, are they going to think I'm silly, like some blonde, silly model? And, you know, I then felt really proud being able to talk about my brand and business. But I was like, wow, if I didn't have that, would I feel, you know, valid? And I was like, oh, that's something I've got to work on because who cares if they're highly successful and super rich? That doesn't matter. I should still be able to be in an environment with those people. So I think confidence is something you take note of when you're not really not feeling confident. 
And then you think about why is it that I'm not feeling comfortable in this environment or confident? And then work through all the reasons why you can't not be confident, if that makes sense. Kind of derail those that thought process. So it's like, I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not successful enough. I'm not thin enough, fat enough, whatever it might be, white enough. Like you literally write all those things down and then write the reason why that doesn't matter. Mm. Because I'm me, because I'm already good enough, because I'm the only me. I'm one of a kind. I'm unique. I have so much to offer. I'm creative. I'm funny. I'm cool. I'm a good friend. And then like reeling off those other things, it's like, that's where that sense of confidence comes from. And then you get to a point where like no one can take it away from you because I'm me, you're you. And even if you don't agree with me, if you don't think I'm cool, confident, funny, whatever, it's like, I've decided that that for me. Yeah. And so I think that it really helps going in front of the mirror and unlearning or even just thinking, what's the first thing I say to myself when I look in the mirror? A lot of the times it's not very nice things. Mm -hmm. Like people get in front of the mirror and they'll be like, oh, I wish, you know, I didn't have these eye bags or I wish I didn't have this freckle or I wish this or I wish that or, oh, I feel disgusting or, and they're all really negative. And a lot of the times, where does that come from? The unrealistic beauty standards, something a bully taught you when you were younger, something your parents maybe even used to comment and call you. And you have to kind of like unpack those things and remove them, throw them in the trash. Like if you need a visual, write them on a piece of paper, rip that piece of paper up, burn that piece of paper. If you really do have like really ingrained kind of like thoughts about yourself or names for yourself. There was one girl I did this with and literally she looked in the mirror and said, the first word that comes to mind is horse face. And I was like, what, where does that come from? She goes, that's why I was bullied growing up. I was like, wow, you've held on to that definition that a bully from high school gave you for another 10, 15 years of your life. We have to dismantle that today. We have to like really erase that. And we have to pick a different word. What's the word now that you want for yourself when you look in the mirror and you define yourself? Yeah. And you have the power to do that. No one else. Obviously, it can be helpful to have compliments. But a lot of the time, people are giving us compliments every day, our friends and our family and loved ones, and they don't absorb. Really, it's the words that you give yourself that are going to absorb. So that's the first thing you want to do is get in front of the mirror and really decide these are the words that I'm going to use to define me. No matter yeah. what anyone else wants to say, I know who I am. And these are, this is my definition of me and that's it. That's final. Yeah. Paying attention to the self-talk is so, yeah, so important because it, it can, even if you think like, oh, I'm not that negative, like about myself, mm -hmm. like when you pay attention to the actual thoughts that come out, mm -hmm. it's, it's jarring. It is. It <laughs> yeah. Is. And how to heal your mental. I would say therapy is a great tool. Oh yeah. If you have Therapy's access amazing. to yeah. and can afford therapy, there are great sites. Like I found my therapist on BetterHelp. Mm. And if you don't even have insurance, like it's a, it's just a great easy way to start, I feel like. Yeah. Finding someone. Um, I don't know. How else can you heal your mental? I think. I think it's a similar thing, right? Taking note of how you got to this place. Right. Was it because maybe you feel lonely? You don't feel seen or heard or validated or you don't know where your sense of self-worth and value comes from. And then it's like either reading books, podcasts, like surrounding yourself with friends, with community, online, finding people who uplift and help you figure that out. Because it's not going to happen overnight. It's yeah. not going to be one thing you decide to do. It's going to be an overhaul of like, I'm putting myself first. My mental health comes before anything and everything. I need to set boundaries. I need to start looking when I wake up in the morning. Am I choosing and following the things that fulfill me, that give me purpose, that I actually enjoy doing? Or am I being sucked into a world or around people that don't make me feel good and that are bringing me down? So it's like a whole overhaul. So I think that first step is really like write a letter to yourself, mm, you know, or writing. write a letter to your younger self, like really go back and kind of unpack, like, how did I get here? Because it also doesn't happen in a day. Your mental health deterioration usually is a combination of many, many things. And maybe something has triggered you. And when you go back and if you can't afford a therapist, you can be your own therapist by going back and thinking, you know what? I think when I was younger, my parents used to use disappointment as my method of discipline. And lately I've been feeling like I'm disappointing people mm -hmm. and I'm, that's making me feel really shitty. So you know what? I have to like realize that this is my inner child that I have to nurture 
and like apologize to and love and value. And I have to tell the people around me, hey, you know what? When you tell me you're disappointed in me or when I disappoint you, I need extra support because this is something that I know I now struggle with. So kind of going through and we know ourselves better than anyone. We just sometimes don't want to dig it up on our own because it's scary. Yeah. (laughs) And so a therapist is usually a safe space, but speak to your friends, speak to your loved ones, speak to people you can trust and say like, I'm doing some work on myself and I'm trying to figure out, you know, did you have any experiences when you were younger that are showing up now and make you feel a certain way? And it can just help kind of talking to anybody, a therapist or just someone, you know, close to you you can trust. Yeah. And I think the fact that you're even messaging me and asking how to heal your mental health is yes, an amazing aware. first step mm-hmm. because it starts with you. Yeah. And you can even start by just journaling and being honest with exactly. yourself in your journal and like going back and like you said, like thinking about things that have happened and why they trigger you and start there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, this next question I love because it's just like fun. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about yourself? Mm. inside and out so a physical one and a personality one that is a fun one so inside my determination Mm. (laughs) I will never give up (laughs) Um, (laughs) sometimes that's probably exhausting (laughs) but um I'm really proud of myself for not giving up or else I would never be here and I hope other other people know that like determination is like key to success um and then the outside oh my gosh lots of things like your webbed toes <laughs> the webbed toes are awesome they helped me be a fast swimmer I like my armpits they're really bright and smooth <laughs> that <laughs> is a flex. smell because of salt air um I really like my freckles actually um, I think what's really interesting is my skin it feels like patchwork because my arms are really freckly mm. and then like my stomach is not and it has more of like an olive skin complex and I remember when I was younger and I used to I used to really sunbathe like oil well I didn't even sunbathe I burnt myself to then one day get brown like tan it was weird I just I'm I have Irish skin but I would hate it because my arms would be so red and freckly and my stomach would go nice and brown and I just wished all the time I was like I wish my whole body would be like the skin that's on my stomach you know, it's like just ridiculous things like that. Yeah. It's like, so now actually I just, I think it's kind of cool that I have different types of skin almost, but it's all my my body. Yeah. But they like tan differently and look different and are freckly and some aren't and some are bumpy and some are rough. And now I'm just like a little patchwork. <laughs> Do you have freckles all, like everywhere? Like That's what I'm saying. I have this weird like freckly patch here. Yeah. And then I have uh... loads on my arms all over my arms but then I'll have like chunks where I don't well maybe I'm getting more freckles as I get older who knows what's going on but freckles um, are so cute people are trying to like buy freckles now like people (laughs) literally put them on them there's literally a one of a brand sent me something that you can just like flick and then the product like comes on your face to make it look like oh my gosh they're getting trendy I mean at least that's quicker than the people I see who dot Dot. (laughs) every single one on I'm like whoa that's a lot yeah um Okay, I guess I'll answer it too. Okay. My favorite thing about myself personality-wise would be I think just like my curiosity for Mm. life, but also like my courage because like I've done a lot of things and tried a lot of things, made a lot of leaps, (laughs) and I'm not afraid to do that. Like – yeah. Like I like we were just talking about me quitting my job, like yeah, and tr- trying to model or like going on a TV show. Like I'm just, yeah, I will always take so. that leap because yeah. I don't want to regret not doing it. Mm-hmm. So I love that about myself. And outside, who? <laughs> so many options to choose from. <laughs> um, I have great legs. In yes, case you, you guys do. haven't seen them, mm-hmm. they're very long. I measured once; they're over four feet alone. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, just yeah, the legs. Just the legs. I like my they eyes are too. Iconic. They're like yeah. a little almond shape, so I like my eyes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, we love ourselves, guys. <laughs> Iskra, you have been amazing. Yay. Thank you for all of the nuggets of knowledge. I'm sure everyone want to find you, so tell everyone where they can find you. You can find me at Iskra, I-S-K-R-A, on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I'm, I'm going to have a comeback on there, I swear. <laughs> um, and then my brand, Saltair. We're on Instagram at Saltair, S-A-L-T-A-I-R. And we're Saltair official on TikTok. Lord knows who took our handle from us, but you know. Ugh, I can't get that. the vulnerable one on TikTok oh, either. Oh, <laughs> damn it. And our podcast. Yes. <laughs> Mine and Philip's podcast is at Couplish Pod um, on TikTok. 
and Instagram. But if you just search Copulation wherever you listen to podcasts, you'll find us. <laughs> Chat away about relationships. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> And you can find me on YouTube at Vulnerable Pod and then at Chelsea Vaughn and at Chelsea Vaughn underscore on TikTok. Thank you guys for being here. Thank, Thank you for coming you. into the studio and we'll see you guys next episode.